Okay, let's have some fun. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar organized by JetBrains. Maybe you've thought, I spent a lot of time in PyCharm, and gosh, if I just learned a few pro tips, I could be so much more productive. Hint, you're right. If so, this webinar is for you. Today, we're covering 42 PyCharm tips and tricks, productivity boosters that speed up your Python development and help you get into the coding flow. We're all about getting into the coding flow. If you'd like to follow along, this URL, helpfully labeled follow along, is a repository with the code samples I'm going to be going through, as well as a link to a playlist that we'll talk about a little bit later. So go ahead and follow that along. This is the repository that I was talking about on GitHub. This is the URL, it's also here github.com slash Paul Everett 42 workshop. You don't really have to follow along, but if you'd like to, um, that would be probably a better way to learn. Additionally, there's this link, and this is the surprise, the big secret. Every tip, every one of the 42 tips in this webinar has a page associated with it. For example, the very first one we're gonna cover, find action has an entire page with a short video, a write-up, links to related things, an in-depth discussion with extra information, and then me narrating a 30 second, 45, maybe a minute video talking about the things discussed up here. That will let you just relax, pay attention, learn, and then if you want to follow up on the details, come back to the playlist later. All right, here we go. Going over to PyCharm. Let me go ahead and close some of these. And each one of the tips are numbered, or a module that's numbered in the 42 directory. And we'll go ahead and begin. Tip number one, find action, the tip of all tips. I am a man of a certain age. I can't be counted upon to remember any new thing because I will have to forget an old thing. I can't remember shortcuts anymore. Let's say I want to find all instances of the string Mary in this directory, find and path. What's it shortcut? Who knows? How should I know? Instead, use the one action that gets you to all other actions, which is find action. And this is on the Mac, Command Shift A. And uh, let me make sure that I've got, yeah. Down at the bottom, you'll see as I go through this, something called uh, Description of Actions, the Presentation Assistant plugin that I use for my presentations. And it tells you the name of the action and the keyboard sequence. So in this case, I want to do Find Action, Command Shift A, and I'm covering that up. But I now say, okay, I don't want to remember find and path, so I'll type find and path. Oh, it's shift command F. I'll hit enter, I'll type Mary, and it shows me at that location in the directory tree, all the files with the name Mary. I could double click on it to go open it. Now some variations on this. Sometimes the thing you want to go find, the action you want to find is kind of long, like find in path. Don't want to type all that. Instead, use speed typing and type parts of each word. F-I-P-A. Look, it's the first one. Find and path. Speed typing in hump case and other names. Speed typing is something that will be uh, very frequent in this webinar. And all of these tips is a way to speed you up. Little known tip. You can find not just actions, but preferences. We'll see this in the third tip. But for now, let's say I want to look at the Python imports preferences. Oop, import preferences. I could go down to this one, and if I just hit enter right now, it will toggle that preference from the on status to the off status. A pretty cool way to quickly um, change a certain preference back and forth. All right, that's the first one, find action. Let's go to the second tip, reduce clutter. It's all the rage these days, getting into Zen mode, having an editor which doesn't have a whole bunch of stuff on the screen. We are an IDE, 
integrated development environment, we do a lot, which means there's a lot on the screen. But if you want to have that kind of lean and mean mode, we can have that as well. And that's what we will show in 42 Tips and Tricks. So I'm going to turn some of this stuff off. I'm going to turn off the toolbar. I'm going to turn off the toolbar, tool windows bar. I'm going to turn off the status bar. Uh, actually, no, I'll keep the status bar. But I will turn off the navigation bar, and I like that one. And now I get a little bit more of a Zen mode because I've done these three actions. Uh, and from this point forward, I'm going to learn some of the tools to make those things appear only when I need them, not have them in my face all the time. All right, here we go, the big one. Dun, dun, dun. You see, I've got tabs up here. People like tabs. And I walk up to see, I see people that have, you know, 5,000 files on their Windows desktop and 400 tabs open in Chrome. And you got to wonder, can you really keep all that in your head? We're going to show a mode of development, which is tabless, turning off these tabs and using other techniques to move around in your code and to get to the thing that you want to get to. So how do I change the tabs behavior and change it from placement top to placement none? I can go to preferences and go to editor and then what's the next one down? General, editor tabs, and then change the placement from top to none. Or, and you can tell because I forgot the path to get to this, that was a lot of work. Instead, let's use the tip we saw before, find action, can also change settings for um, some of your preferences. So I'm going to look for window tab placement, none. And you see how I did speed typing on that to only get to the thing that I needed. And when I hit enter, my tabs go away because that preference was set. Let's see that one again. We see now that that is changed from off to on because I used find actions to select a preference and then to actually change the preference in the middle of find actions. Pretty cool. Now at this point, I've got my layout in a pretty good mode. We're gonna do one more big thing. We're gonna turn off the project tool because I don't need to think about files. That's another theme in this webinar. Navigate by code, not by files. So I can turn that off. I can go into full screen mode and let's, let's admit it. This is a pretty nice uh, workflow. Uh, everything is lean and mean. So I need to get to, eh, let me turn project back on. Okay, I'm gonna go to recent files because I need to show you one or two other things before we can uh, turn off the project tool. Recent files, Command E, Control E. This is the first one, the first tool that lots of people turn to for jumping around in their code and not having to double click on files, open directory trees, have tabs, go back and forth. So for example, I wanna go to the last file that I just visited. Um, and that happens a lot in development. You're developing one thing that imports another thing and you're jumping back and forth between the two. Command E, oop, wrong one. Command E, brings up this dialogue called recent files. And it defaults to be the, not the, the one that I'm sitting on, but the last one that I was sitting on. And if I hit enter, I jump back and forth between two things that I'm working on. Or I can go further back using my mouse or my keyboard to get to that one. Or I can go back to the one that I was on. Or, much better, I can use speed search. So command E, S, O, 2, jumps me to reduce clutter, or I could have said reduce clutter, or I could have said CLU, and it filters the list to match the speed search condition. This is a pervasive idiom 
in our IDE and all of our IDEs. When confronted with a list, don't use your mouse, don't use your down arrow, start typing and filter the list. And there's also a variation which you can see from this checkbox. Maybe you don't want to do just recently visited, but only recently changed. So there's a variation of recent files, which is recently changed files. And I can get to that with Command E. All right, we also can do um, getting to tools. So I turned off the project, okay? I turned off the project tool. How do I get to it? I could memorize a shortcut. But I'm tired of memorizing shortcuts. I want just a couple of things that can lead me to the other things. Um, in this case, I can use recent files, but you may have noticed in this left-hand column, those aren't files. Those are the tool windows that I turned off when I was doing reduce clutter. If I start typing at this point, for example, terminal, then I will open the terminal. That is the way I get to the terminal 500 times a day. Command, oh, goodness. Command E, T E R, enter, and I have my terminal. Now, navigate symbol and navigate file gets into the heart of the matter. And I'm gonna leave the project tool open a little bit more until we get down to the nav bar stuff uh, to show you how you can get back to files. Navigate symbol. You don't want to navigate your project by code or by files, you wanna navigate by code. Who knows what that file name is? Who knows what its parent and grandparent directory was? Who cares? It's got a class in it, and I know the name of the class, and I will jump to that by class name, not by file name. So for example, um, I've got a class called Greeter that's in 42.models, which I import from here, uh, that's uh, imported in Dunder Init. So there's this thing right here, and I want to go jump to it. Well, I could go and double click on here and then find out, well, it was actually in there and then scroll down to the class. And then I've forgotten what I was doing. Instead, navigate by code, not by files. In this case, greeter is a symbol. And one of these shortcuts, Alt Command O, will to uh, find not by file name or anything like that a symbol. So if I start typing greeter, it will find, oh, I should say greeter, it will find that symbol. And if I hit enter, it will open that file and put my cursor directly on the line that defines that symbol. And now I've seen everything I need to. I want to go right back to where I was. And recent files will put me right back where I was. Now, what's also interesting, and this is the difference between an IDE and a graded development environment and an editor, we index your code in your project. But we also index the code in your dependencies to allow you to navigate to symbol for anything, anywhere. So for example, I've got something called a service registry in one of my dependencies, and I wanna go jump to that symbol. So I can bring up, navigate to symbol, and type in parts of service registry. And there, I have a dependency called wired. There's a module in there called container, and that defines a symbol called service registry. When I press enter, I go to the Dunder Init that defines service registry. So go back with recent files. Um, and what that was showing when I did this search for capital S-E-R, capital R-E-G, that this hump case, camel hump, speed typing, also works as a way to narrow a list instead of having to type out service registry altogether. 
Okay, onward. That is 06. Let's go to navigate by file. Maybe you do need to look for the name of a file. So for example, 01, that's not going to be in a symbol. It's in the file name. Maybe I want to get to that. And what we saw before when I did navigate to symbol, you may have noticed that there are other tabs up here, like the find action thing that we did in tip number one is just a tab. This unified find anything anywhere pop-up window. So we want to navigate by files and I type in 01. And there is, or I could say S01, and it finds the file starting with SO1. And I press enter and it opens that file and it puts the cursor in the last place I was sitting in the last time I visited this file. What are some other things we can do? Well, there's a richer speed type syntax. Let's take a look for anything uh, for a file that has MO under a directory that has FO. So I'll bring up, um, find by files and I'll type fo slash mo and look there's my 42 dot models which is this file right here it's under 42 which starts with fo and then it's models which starts with mo I want to take a look at something in the dependencies to see if I can find files over in my dependencies that have a substring in them so I bring up that same navigate to file dialog and I type in pool M and look, it's the pool manager file module in the URL, URL lib three vendor import of the pip package. And I could jump directly to that file as well. So that's navigate to file. We saw navigate symbol, navigate file, navigate action. They are all variations of the same pop-up window that has a lot of the same behavior. Uh, looking outside of your project, speed typing, hump casing, directory pass slashing, et cetera. All right, navigate to cursor. This is a fun one. When you get into the flow, a lot of times when you're debugging, for example, in our awesome visual debugger, you will start going down a rabbit hole and keep clicking and keep clicking and keep navigating and keep opening and then forget where you were. And life's too short, I can't remember what I was doing 20 seconds ago. Can my tool help me? Yes, it can. So for example, I have this symbol app and I'm going to use command B to navigate to symbol, which is the symbol that you're sitting on. And then I'm going to navigate to another symbol called service registry. And then I'm going to see how to get back up to this spot and then change my mind and go back down to that spot. So command B jumps to the definition of app. Here's something called service registry. I'm going to do command B, jump to its definition, and I'm going to make, oh yeah, okay, I understand what's going on. Where was I? Huh. Well, tabs are off, which is good, but Maybe the IDE, if I do command left bracket, will walk me back up the breadcrumb trail that I just went down. Oh, wait, no, actually, I wanted to be down there. Command right bracket will go back down the last breadcrumb trail that you went. Very, very useful way to navigate without having to have files or tabs and keep all that context in your head. All right, activating the nav bar. This is going to be a sequence of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six tips, all focused on the thing that I turned off. I turned off the navigation bar. Did I turn it off because it's not useful? No, I didn't. It's very useful. I use it all the time, but I don't need it all the time. I just need it when I need it on demand. So I'll turn it back off. Whoop, there. And I will bring it up on demand temporarily, use it, and it will go away. So for example, um, I want I want to browse files and I've got the project tool turned off at long last. And now I got plenty of real estate. I could put my run tool window or my test window over here or something like that. 
But if I do actually need to browse the files, what am I gonna do? Well, I could bring the project tool back up. Oh, that's just no fun. Cause then I gotta turn it back off. Instead, I could jump to the navigation bar using command up on Mac OS, alt home on Win Linux. So command up and look, I get a little transient pop-up version of the navigation bar, which is previ was previously a permanent entry in the toolbar. And then I can dismiss it by either hitting or clicking somewhere else. Either way, I use escape. Now, what can we do with that? Um, let me turn this back on before I do the big reveal. This is the one where I get to turn it off. I can navigate files with the navigation bar instead of this monstrosity, the project tool window. So for example, I, let's say I'm sitting on uh, S10 navigate files and I want to go to S09. I could hit command up to get the navigation bar. I could go to the directory and I can hit down and go to that file, which means I can turn off the project tool window. And whenever I actually do want to think about files, not symbols, and I don't have anything in recent files to jump to, or I just want to look around because I'm browsing, not searching, bring the navigation bar back up, go to the place you need to go, hit down, choose the file, and hit enter. One little point, this point, is when you bring it up, you may be tempted to, if you wanna to go to a sibling of the current file, like S09, you may be tempted to go up to 42, but you don't have to, it, it, sorry, you may be tempted to go up to 42 and then down, but you don't have to. You could just hit, uh, activate the nav bar and immediately hit down, and it will open the current directory. In, a, in the little pop-up dropdown. What else can we do with this? Turns out a whole lot. I can, for example, now go to the next tip without having to open the project tool window. Let's say I want to open a file, this is what I just did, open a file with the navigation bar. I can activate the navigation bar, find the file that I want to open, for example, this file, and hit enter. Or I can go up, down, and hit enter. Several other things that we can do with that. Let's go on to tip number 12, speed search. This gets a lot easier after this. When I'm in this navigation bar, and I've got a long listing. We mentioned that any time in the IDE that you're faced with a long listing, you can just speed type. So for example, I'm about to go to S13. I could type S13 and hit enter, or S42 and hit enter. So speed typing, I don't even have to Speed typing is a great way when you're using the navigation bar to quickly, lickety splittily, that's not a word, quickly move around your directories in your file system. So I need to go now to S13. What else can I do? Well, just about anything that you want to do in the project tool window, which we, we don't like anymore. So we'll turn it back off. Anything you can do over there, you can do over here in the navigation bar without having to use the mouse. And that's part of the whole point of this is tablets and all this other stuff. Keep your hands on the keyboard so that you stay in the flow. So I'm going to add a navigation bar here. And let's say I want to go somewhere in the project tree, like the root, I want to make a todo.txt file. What would I do if it was the project tool? I would click on that directory and I would do command N, file, type in the name, 
And there I am. And I'll say, no, don't, I don't want to put that in BCS. So in this case, I use the navigation bar to go up to something. I could have gone down to another directory, back down into 42, whatever. I could have gone into tests, and then I could have created the file there. All right, that's creating a new file with the navigation bar. What else we got with the navigation bar? We can find in path the thing that we did uh, in the very first tip, actually. But we don't have to use the project tool window to do it. So for example, that we'll recreate the exact one that we did. Activate the navigation bar. Go to the place that I want to start searching. And what's the key sequence? It's shift command F and it brings up find and path. Same thing we saw before. And remember, you can go up, down, into, and then do your, your uh, search find and path from anywhere, any directory anywhere in your tree. Uh, you may think, hey, wow, that's pretty cool. Can I do other things like rename a file using the navigation bar, not using the mouse? Sure, of course, I could go up to this file that I just made to do.txt and I could do control T, refactor, rename, and uppercase it to make it, and eh, make it a markdown file. And I've refactored, renamed that file. Again, not using the mouse, but instead using the keyboard. All right, that finishes the part about um, using the navigation bar. Let's move on to adding a line. This is a tip that happens all the time. My son writes Python games with me and he has to remember this one. Saves a lot of time. What usually happens is, um, let's say that I'm on this line and I want to put a statement uh, indented on the next line. Usually what you do is you use your mouse and click to the end, or you, what he does is blah, blah, blah. Oh, I got it wrong, but oh, wait, I got it, oh, wait, I got it wrong. Hit enter, and then you get the indentation. Or maybe you're a little faster and you've got Emacs key bindings or something, and you hit control E to go to the end of the line, and then you hit enter. Instead, there is an action, start new line, which is shift enter on all three operating systems put your cursor there, hit shift enter, and get kind of a smart start new line. It understands the context, what the indentation should be, and can be run from the middle of a line. Uh, here's one that I, I struggle to remember this one, and I fall back to find action all the time. A lot of times I've got some code where there's an import, and I want an import before this, and I'm like, here? And I'm like, okay, I will, I will go, here's what I do. I go to the end of the line, hit my right cursor key, up, enter, up, and then I type the import, which is all pretty dumb. Uh, instead, you can do, um, and see, I have to go back and get the start new line uh, action, alt, command, enter, alt, ooh, command, enter, adds a new line in the same concept of being in the right indentation, but above the line that you want. So if I'm on this line and I do Alt Command, I'll do that. Alt Command Enter, then it will start a new line indented correctly above the current cursor position. As you saw with me fumbling around ridiculously, here's the way I do it. All you have to do is find action and type, what is that, STBE, STBE, start new line before current and hit enter. Let's do that again. STBE. All right, great. All right, so that's tip number 15. Let's go on to 16, make and extend selection. Let's say I want to select some code and my cursor is in the middle and I want to select these three lines. Here's what everybody does. Use the mouse and make a big block. 
There's a little bit of an easier way. Um, let's say I wanna select the whole block or the line or just the word or whatever. You can make and extend a selection using the keyboard. It's actually pretty easy. Alt up goes from the cursor to the symbol. Alt up again, gets a little bigger. Alt up again, gets a little bigger, 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 a little bigger. Oh, that's too far. Alt down goes backwards. Now, this can be pretty useful when we look at the next tip, moving a block. I have a customer definition inside this context manager with thingy. Doesn't really need to be there. Um, it's not part of the context. I really should move it up. How would we usually do it? Triple click, cut, move, enter, paste, all new line, crud, all that stuff. Instead, use what we just learned. And my cursor is somewhere in here. I'm going to make extend selection to get the line. And then I'm going to use move line up. Alt shift up, alt shift down on Mac OS. Alt shift up. And now I do tab to fix the indentation. That works for a block. So for example, if I had, gosh, we'll just do this whole block here. I could move this whole thing out to there, for example. Doesn't make sense, but you can select a block and move a block at a time. Do, 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 back to where you are. That is a surprisingly useful tip. That happens a lot, selecting code and moving code. Do it without the mouse, do it with your keyboard, do it efficiently. All right, let's go on to 18. Reformat code. Oh yeah, this is the one that everybody does a trillion times a day. I do it even when I don't need to do it, just because it makes me feel like things are clean. Probably says a little bit about me. So this code has three warnings. PyCharm has said a warning here, a warning here, and a warning here. So what are these? Well, what are they always? PEP8 violations. There's supposed to be two lines here. Got some white space that's not needed. And then down here, indentation is not a multiple of four. It's only two spaces. Well, I could be the janitor and go and fix these things. Okay. Now you, uh, let me do it. Now are you happy? Oh, no, now you're not happy. Now are you happy? Okay, now you're happy. <sighs> now are you happy? All right, good. Now are you happy? Okay, good, thanks. Instead, life's too short. Let us be your janitor. Let PyCharm be your janitor. Reformat code, Alt-Command-L on Mac OS, Control-Alt-L on Windows. One shot, everything is formatted nicely. No more PEP8 violations. I can prove that by clicking here. No problems found. Reformat code covers a lot of things and it covers them according to the settings that you have for the project. So you get to tell it what uh, things you like. All right. 19, optimize imports. Another janitorial task that it's awesome to let the IDE do for you. In this case, I've got some unused imports. Uh, import OS, it's not used. I have another import violation. Um, I have an unsorted import list. Time should be after sys. And maybe in this project, I want to uh, um, take multiple imports from the same module and split them into different import lines. So optimize imports is right up there with reformat code, something I do all the time on the Mac, control alt O. Oh, I've, I've certainly worn out my keyboard on this one. Control alt O. Watch carefully as those two, line 24, line 25, line 26 change. There we go. Import OS was removed as an import because it was unused and my imports were sorted correctly. How can I get this? Let's say my project's style is to split these. I can go to, I'll skip the undo redo. I can go to preferences because of the imports and make that statement.
So here, structure of from imports, it's currently join imports with the same source, always split imports, I will do that. And now when I, keep an eye on this, when I optimize imports, it's split and split sorted correctly. All right, janitorial work, let the IDE do your janitorial work. More janitorial work. We want a random customer, all right? Instead of having Larry, I want to get a random choice to assign customer from the list of customers. And I want to use the Python random package in the standard library to do choice from random. So one way I can do it is start typing random, but then PyCharm tells me unresolved reference. Well, that's not good. I can let PyCharm generate the import for me. Even better though, we know not only the name of the package, we know the name of the function. Start typing choice, alt enter, import this name from random. And we see it generated the import using my import style guide. But wait, there's more. What if it's like a long thing I wanna import? I don't wanna type all that. I could type this and do control space space and let it present to me an auto-completed list of symbols from stuff in my dependencies or my own project. And I can hit enter and it will complete the name of the function, choice, and generate the import so that it works. I never come up here and type imports. Let, let's look at what that would be like otherwise. So I'm like, okay, choice, okay, I gotta do choice. Oh, I gotta stop what I'm doing from random import choice. What was I doing? Where was I? Oh, I was down here. Life's too short to do that janitorial work. Okay, on to 21. Well, let me get this so we don't see these errors anymore. 21. Install an import. So I showed you how the janitor can do your work to sort your imports and get rid of unused imports. The janitor can even generate your imports. The janitor can even install the package, generate the import for you from the middle of your typing. So for example, here I've got this thing called Maya that I've typed. But PyCharm's telling me, eh, unresolved reference Maya. What can you do to help me? I'll do Alt Enter, which is our way into the universe of code insight and janitorial work. Alt Enter. Well, I could import Maya. Uh, let's see. So my mistake was forgetting to uh, get rid of this from the last time I gave this. So let me go to the project interpreter and delete Maya and write down that, uh... all right. So now I've got um, some code where I've typed in Maya, but not only have I not imported it, I actually haven't even installed it. So when I go to Alt-Enter, I don't get any intentions because I did this in the middle of, um, removing it from the project. What you would see otherwise is, and this is the peril of using an EAP, Alt-Enter would bring up an option to install and import the package Maya. All right, onward. Doo, doo, doo. Adding fields. This is one that you'll use a lot if you do a lot of class programming. I've got a class customer and I wanna initialize it with something called name and store it as an instance variable. Here's what it looks like the dumb way, comma, name, and then self.name equal name. That's a lot of typing. Um, things like TypeScript and Python data classes make this a lot easier, but if you can't use them, what you could do instead is do name, alt enter, and say, hey, IDE janitor, help me out on this. Add a field called name to class customer. When I press enter, the first thing it's going to do is maybe I want to rename it to first name. 
And then when I hit enter, it accepts everything and it's stored on the instance. Renaming a file. Um, and this was something I was at a conference last week. And so I said, oh, wow, I got to make this change. And then I've got to go look everywhere and rename the imports. No, let the janitor do it for you. So for example, in this file, I'm importing something called models. But it's only got one thing in it. Maybe I want to call it model, singular. And then I think, uh, so I'm going to go to 42 files and fix that. Maybe I'll just leave it as models. Fortunately, refactoring like that becomes a lot easier with an IDE that looks at all the code in your project. I will bring up the nav bar, go to 42, go to models, and then I will refactor rename and call this model. And I'm going to tell it to search for references. Don't search there, but just search for references to rename the file and all of its usages. So it's looked everywhere, it's done that, it fixed the name here, it even fixed git and vcs to do the rename there. And you can see that it actually renamed the file because now I have model. And then I realize, wait, no, that's dumb because I'm about to add another model and it'll be plural again. Wouldn't it be nice if I could just undo the naming of the file, the renaming of all the imports, and the VCS add. That was one IDE transaction. So undo undoes the refactor renaming, not just of the file, but of the imports and the VCS. Puts it back exactly the way it was before I did refactor rename. Rename symbol. So greeter, I've got something called greeter, but eh, maybe I want to call it welcomer because that sounds more welcoming. And same kind of thing. I think oh, I've got 42 files with this in it. I don't want to go to 42 files to do all that renaming. I'll just leave it the way it is. No, do what you want. Go to navigate to the symbol. Cursor is sitting on it. Refactor, control T, then choose rename and call it Welcomer. Hit enter. It's looking for all the usages. And then when I go back to the file that I was just sitting on, I see that what, uh, the class is uh, the class that's being imported is named Welcomer. In fact, when you saw recent files, see that's all blue. We'll talk about that later. That means that those all change from a VCS perspective. It changed everything because everything uses Welcomer. Now, I realize I hate Welcomer. Greeter was better. I want to go back to the way it was. Same thing applies. Undo does an entire IDE transaction. Changes not just the name of the symbol where it was declared here, but all the imports that used it as well. This is a pretty good, in, well, I'll show one more thing. I was doing this by refactor rename by going to the class and doing refactor rename there. But I could actually do it on a usage of the class. I could put my cursor right there, say refactor rename, welcomer, hit enter, it's gonna look for everything. And now when I go visit Welcomer, I see that it did it. Same rules apply for undo, undo renaming class, et cetera. And this is kind of an important, important part about the difference between an editor and an IDE. We index everything, and that's that lovely little indexing thing that you get when you open a project. And what that gives you is symbols instead of strings. We can operate on symbols. For example, if I made a new file called bogus, and in there I put class greeter, and I did a rename to welcomer, if I go look at bogus, it didn't get changed. 
just because the string matched, the symbol didn't. It's a different symbol in Python. So let me put this back to the way it was. All right. Spend a little extra time on that one because I like it. Quick documentation. How often does this happen to you? You see some kind of symbol like choice. What's that? You stop what you're doing. You go look at the import. Okay, random. That's in the, what is that in? Is that in the Python standard library or one of my dependencies? I think it's in the Python standard library. <sighs> Open up a browser, Google for blah, 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 blah. By now you've totally out of the flow, forgotten everything. Instead, wouldn't it be nice if your IDE could non-disruptively, non pronounce words, non-disruptively show you a little bit of documentation about the thing that you're sitting on. So in on the Mac, that's F1. My cursor's on choice. I hit F1. It's fetching the documentation. Tells me what the signature of, of it is, the doc string, and a little bit more information, including a link to jump directly to that in my browser. Little variation on that, parameter info. So for example, choices is kind of weird. Um, don't know what it wants. So I'm sitting here typing and what are some of the things that I might be able to get from this? I want to view parameter info, which is view parameter info. So I'm sitting in here. If I do command P on the Mac or control P on Windows Linux, it tells me what this crazy statistical choicey thing wants. And I can say customers. And as I type, the bold is moving to show me the parameter that I need. And if I move back to here, it tells me that. Over to running code. We've done a lot about editing code and navigating code. Let's talk about running some code um, using the keyboard instead of the mouse. I turned everything off. I don't have that toolbar up there that I love so much that lets me click to run things. But now I'm gonna run things from the keyboard. So for example, uh, let's say I've run this and I wanna rerun it. Control R reruns your active run configuration. So it runs it again. But what if you want to go to a different run configuration? Well, that might mean something like turning on the toolbar, going to find the drop down, selecting it, making it active and running it. Uh, but there's another choice. When you look under the run there, it tells you some of these other choices. So for example, control alt R is the one I do all the time. Control alt R brings up a little non-disruptive pop-up window that lets you, for example, run this one instead. Or I want to run that one instead. Or I want to do more than just run it. I hit right arrow because this has a sub menu. I could debug it. I could run it under coverage. I could edit the run configuration or I could delete it. So lots of things that are possible from that. And in fact, there's another thing that I do quite a lot, which is speed type 25. Right. That's the way I switch between, especially in test running, that's the way I switch between run configurations. All right, let's speed up a little bit. I've got some conditional breakpoints. I'm debugging, but I only, only want to stop in certain points. So I'm in the greeter, but I want to stop only when I'm greeting Larry. So I've got a breakpoint here, and if I run and Let's see. If I run it normally, or I should say debug it normally, it will run, it will stop on that line, and it's Alice. Oh, crap. Okay, next time. Oh, it's Sam. Crap. Still Sam. Where's Larry? Sam again. Oh, this random thing. It's always Sam. It's never Larry. Come on, keep going until it's actually going to be eventually Larry. So instead, I can control click on the breakpoint, come to this thing called condition, and type in a condition. 
Only when the value of customer equals Larry do I want this breakpoint to stop. Note that it remembers some of the previous things that you've done. So now when I run the debugger, we're going to stop on Larry. Hey, Larry. All right. So next, let's do evaluate expression. Lots of times when you're debugging, you stomp on a breakpoint, you poke around. Unfortunately, I'm not saying you do it, but people have been known to use print statements as a way for poking around. Instead, you can do evaluate expression. So for example, I'm going to, um, I'm going to poke around before this line is actually run. I'm going to put a breakpoint here. And I'm going to debug this. It's going to stop on that line. I want to see what that line actually does before it does it. So I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to right click on it and say evaluate expression. It brings up this dialog box with that expression chosen. I type evaluate and I get a result. In fact, I could do something like uh, name equal and look in the background in my scope. I have a new value or I could override an existing value. So uh, evaluate expression is a good way to poke around when you're debugging. Split screen, oh, I love this one. I like to do test-driven development, TDD. And I like to get into a mode where my code is on the left, my test is on the right, and the test runner is on the bottom. And that kind of signals to my reptilian brain, it's testing time, baby. So we want to do side by side, but we turned off tabs. How can we get two files on the screen without tabs? You can use split vertically. So I'm going to do the action, split vertically, another one I do all the time. And I'm going to go up to my tests. Oop. And here are my tests. And I could, for example, I'll get that out of there. Run my tests, right click, run tests. And at the bottom, I get my test output. Codes on one side, tests on the other side, test runner at the bottom. Nice and familiar. Uh, how do you go from code to test? So let's say I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, all right, I need to make a change in main. Well, you know, it's probably the last thing that you had open. So you can use control E, Command or recent files to jump back and forth between things. But if it isn't, if you want to say, I don't care which thing it is on the right, just go to it. I can use Alt Tab to go to the next splitter. So if I've got it split into five windows, Alt Tab will cycle through them. All right. Do, do, do. Run a single test. What if I just, I'm focused on this thing, just this one thing, disable tabs, and I don't want to spend time slowing down on my test running, I can walk up to it and I can say, run the tests. Or I can right click anywhere in it and say, run the tests. And in this, both cases, I'm generating a temporary run configuration you can tell it's temporary because it's got a ghosted icon for running those tests. Auto run. This is the magic of uh, TDD, test driven development. I'm getting into testing mode and I, I'm, I'm writing some things and I'm fixing some things. And this is in what? 32 test 32, right? And things aren't going as expected. I run this test and it fails. Or I make another change and I rerun it and it fails. Why are these things failing? I want to have things run automatically as I fix things. So I come over here and I click on this button, toggle auto test. Next time when I run, it will run but as I type, it will wait two seconds and rerun my tests until I fix it. So I made a little change, but it's not fixed yet. 
Now I made another change. I didn't even have to save and it's fixed. This auto run test doesn't even require me to save. What's the toggle for setting the time? I've got the delay on one, it defaults to three. So for example, if I do that, one, two, three, and now it will redo it. So that all becomes a, a factor of how long do your tests take to run, or am I kind of deep in thinking and I don't know what I'm doing versus I'm just doing janitorial test work. All right, spot coverage. We also have, we have visual running, visual debugging, we have visual testing, we also have visual coverage. So for example, I want to run uh, this, all my code and see the coverage and spot that I don't have any tests for foo. How can I do that? I can right click in here and I can say run with coverage and it will chug along, chug a lugga, 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 run the test, pause for a bit while it's collecting all the coverage information. And we'll talk about this in a second. And it will give me a browsable table saying, well, in the 42 package, 75% are covered, 90, blah, blah, blah. This thing is not covered at all. And there's this file called, uh, these things aren't covered at all. Spot coverage, the thing I'm on is 76% covered. Well, I don't even have to look at this thing to tell. Why? Because the IDE visual coverage helped me. It put color coding in the gutter to tell me what has coverage and what doesn't. In fact, I could click on that and get a little more information and some options about the coverage on this. Uh, to speed up the uh, coverage, you can put a file in the root of your project to govern the coverage information and tell it not to look in your virtual environment. Local history, this is the one that everyone, let me unsplit everything and close this. Uh, and go to my coverage tool. And kill that sweet to get rid of the color coding. Local history. How to save your life when VCS can't save it for you. Maybe you're not using VCS. Maybe you didn't put something under control of VCS. Or maybe you made a really horrible change since the last time you committed and going back to the last commit won't help you. So for example, um, I'm in Maine and let's say I accidentally delete the whole thing. And now I've gone on to do 407 other changes. Undo won't help me because the undo point is so far back that it's beyond the time horizon. And I didn't commit, so I can't get back to it. Instead, let's bring up show history, which is also available under right click and local history and show history. And it lets me for the file that I'm sitting on have a listing of every editor transaction back to a configurable point in time across everything in your project. And then it gives me a diff showing me the current state and the state of that example, or the state of where it was at that point, or the state of where it was at that point. And I can use the diff to recover from my mistake, and we're all good again. This will even handle files that are deleted via the IDE. So let's say I do this, I'm like, hey, life's too short, YOLO. Delete anyway. Oh my God, I just deleted a file that wasn't even under version control yet. I am so screwed. No, you're not. Because what you can do is go to the container and go to local history at the container level. And the container knows that a file was deleted from it. Right click, revert, add it to VCS. 
and I've got my models file back. That's pretty cool. Great uh, project from GitHub. Um, this takes a little bit of time and we're already at an hour, so I'll speed up a little bit. You can go to the version control menu and you can say check out from version control git and put in the URL uh, to get to your repository or you can use it by find action, chve, check out from version control, will take you to a dialog asking you uh, which kind of system, I choose git, same thing. And what this is doing is going to GitHub and looking for all of my projects and repositories across all my organizations that I'm a member of. So for example, I could start typing wired and auto complete that. If I don't have something under version control, I can open an uninitialized project and then type in this sequence, E-N-V-E-C-O, check out, or, oh, oh that, that's because this project is already under version control. Uh, it do, would do the same thing as um, a menu option that would appear if this project wasn't under version control. I do a commit. It has a mistake in the message. So for example, I say um, three words and I commit. I don't push, I just commit. And then I'm like, oh my God, that was a stupid message. What am I gonna do now? You can go to the VCS tool and see in the log tab, this message and I can right click on it. And then I can choose reword and take that off. And it's as if it never happened. Undo commit. Even worse, that whole commit was stupid. Now what do I do? Do I go back in time, find the hash of the pre and oh my gosh. Well, I haven't pushed yet. So the verse control tab can help me again, select that commit, and then go to it and choose undo commit. Now in this case, there were some changes there. They got to go somewhere. Uh, the ID has a concept of change lists with a default change list, or you can make a new change list that defaults to the name of the commit message or something else. I'll skip that. Onward, partial commit. This is a fun one too. This happens to me all the time. I do a whole bunch of work and I'm like squirrel and go do some other work. And I'm on a branch or I'm in an atomic commit and that had no business being in there. So for example, I could do um, commit, uh, and let me put a change in here. And I go to commit, and I wanna commit the change in here, but I don't wanna do anything with this guy. So let's say it was selected. I only, only wanna do that one. So I would unselect, choose that, and maybe I also made a change up here, but I don't want to include that. So I would say only include this file and in here, do not include that line in the commit. And then I would do commit. Two more to go, run NPM scripts. This gets into web stuff. So I'll turn back on the project tool so you can see it. And I've got a package.json in this project. I can right click on it and I can say show NPM scripts and get a little tool window here to browse and run in a dedicated window some of my scripts. And what it's really doing is creating a temporary run configuration for that NPM thing. What's interesting is serve is actually that automatically discovered as an action. And I could say run SE and it will go look at my package.json's NPM scripts and prompt that as something that's runnable. Last one, nope, oh, next to the last one. Wrap with a tag. Let's say that um, demo because, you know, or span. We'll say span, this is the web, and everything has to have 57 divs on it. I can use 
extend selection to select that line, and I can search for an action surround with, and then choose a tag and say div. I could also use this emit thing, this is even cooler, surround with emit and say div.columns, and it will surround it and then auto-complete some of the information that's needed. Last one, uh, the part you just saw was because PyCharm Professional includes WebStorm, our IDE for uh, the web. We also include DataGrip, our IDE for SQL databases, for development of SQL databases. It has gives us this tool called Database, which is for wreaking magic. And working with SQLite is magically magical. I can, I could say add data source SQL. Well, I'm already confused. Or I could just take my database SQLite file, drag, drop it onto the database tool. It will do the work to discover it, the work to connect it. And now I can browse and go to a table and do all of my magical. Uh, visual database things. That's your 40 second tip. Don't forget that you can get all of these in the playlist. All right, so back to the presentation. All right, that was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks everyone stick, for sticking around going through this series of tips. If you have any questions later, please don't hesitate to reach out to us by email or social media. Um, hopefully we've answered most of the questions so far. Uh, maybe you've got some ideas about a tip that I should have covered that's one of your favorites. If you'd like to get more information on PyCharm, please go to our website at jetbrains.com slash PyCharm. We'd love your feedback on this webinar. Hint, give me a high grade. Uh, so maybe I can catch Michael Kennedy if you give me a high grade. Um, so please feel free to contact us on Twitter or in the after webinar survey. The recording will be made available on our YouTube channel soon. If you haven't already, please check out our PyCharm blog. The blog, uh, you can find up-to-date PyCharm news about releases and events in addition to educational resources. So for example, if you want the recording of this webinar, it will be published there in a few days and we'll also tweet about it. Uh, we'll also provide some in, uh, additional links and information from the presentation on the blog. For example, the repo. That's all from us uh, today. Thank you very much for joining us, staying until the end, and hope you have a nice day.